Someone said to me that the problem the Democratic Party, or at least the parts of the Democratic Party with which I had any connection, had was that the people out there in places like Michigan and Ohio basically hate experts more than they hate rich people. And that the Democratic Party was seen as an institution of self-appointed, pompous, arrogant experts coming from places like Harvard, governing uh, the country, and that people actually thought it was fine to have gold faucets. They didn't think it was fine to decree, based on social science, how life was going to be. I have no idea whether that is a wise or unwise analysis, a perceptive or non-perceptive uh, comment, but I do know that democracy does not appear to be in its period of maximum flourishing in the United States and in a variety of other countries. And I do know that my friend Paul Tucker has written an important book that bears on one aspect of uh, democracy, the role of the independent, uh, often appointed expert or agency in carrying out a set of public functions. So I think the former observation suggests that Paul's topic, while always important for the United States and for other countries as well, is probably a particularly important uh, topic at uh, this particular juncture. And that's why I think it's very valuable that we're able to come together uh, for this event. We're gonna proceed as follows. Um, Paul is going to speak for a few minutes, um, describing uh, his main conclusions. Um, his uh, less than 10 minutes of speech will not be able to do full justice to his 600 pages of uh, text, um, but he will do his uh, best. And then I will successively uh, call on four distinguished figures uh, to react uh, to Paul's work, and I will introduce them before uh, they speak. Um, Paul is a Mandarin's Mandarin, having spent more than three decades at uh, the Bank of England and done roughly everything there is to do at uh, the Bank of uh, England. And since leaving he, the Bank of England, he has been associated with uh, the Center of Business and Government uh, at uh, Harvard, where he's made a wide variety of contributions. I have to say that something that impresses me about Paul is that many people hold positions of senior responsibility, leave, and then write books. The vast majority of them are about what a great job I did, along with uh, my colleagues while I was in power, and let's make sure that the future carries on the great traditions of our work. Um, Paul has done something much more novel, and I think uh, more interesting, and quite possibly of much more lasting value in thinking about the aspects of the design of democracy that bear on the sphere that he worked in, central banking, but being led by that inquiry to think much more broadly about uh, democracy. Paul? Thank you very much, Larry, and, and thank you very much to everybody on the, on the panel for agreeing to, to speak about this book. I'm hugely flattered that you should do so. If, you, if you've been in office for a long time and then you branch out into something else, it's a result if, you, if, if people even pretend to take you seriously, let alone actually taking you seriously. So I'm, I'm very glad 
um, to be here. The, 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 the book, is, as Larry said, is about unelected power. It's about the growth of dependence upon experts insulated from politics in our, in our government. If you, if you think back to the, um, the response to the Great Depression in this country uh, and the reforms that followed it, whose face do you associate with that? It's President Roosevelt. So 80 years on, which faces are now going around the country um, talking about how they handled the crisis 10 years ago? Chairman Bernanke of the Federal Reserve, Treasury Secretary Paulson, Treasury Secretary Geithner, the faces of President Bush and President Obama are not associated um, with the response to the crisis. I think that's quite remarkable. I think that it shows a profound change in our system of, of governance. It's not too far of an exaggeration to say that in this country, the marginal lawmaker is an unelected judge or an unelected um, regulator. And in, in my former world of central banking, they now combine quasi-fiscal powers with regulatory powers. Kind of almost, they're there in, in financial and economic emergencies. They kind of span um, government in ways that is quite in, incredible, and, and ways that the, the people who designed the world that we all live in um, of constitutional democracy, John Locke, Montesquieu, um, James Madison, um, these were practical people as well as people um, who thought deeply about values and, and principles, and yet they hadn't thought about this kind of structure of government. And the book, in, the book is, in a way, a, a challenge to legislators and constitutional theorists to take um, this problem seriously, and it's a plea or provocation to political theorists to get really engaged with the institutions of government today um, rather than just um, kind of higher level um, questions. Let me, to the extent that you can see this slide, what you will see is a bunch of acronyms which are agencies in this country of, of different degrees of insulation from day-to-day -day politics, and they all have vague objectives. And the significance of the vagueness is it is the unelected people that sit atop of these institutions who are deciding high policy. So to give you an example I know well, the Securities and Exchange Commission, they have objectives to protect investors, um, to promote efficient markets, and to promote capital formation. These objectives are each vague. They're equally ranked. When you go into work, you just, if you're the boss of that place, you decide which of these you would most like to um, put great weight on. Um, that, that, I'm going to come back to the SEC because it's a less probl problematic example than others, but that's a world where Congress did not decide the objectives of policy um, because those words are too, are too vague. Um, there, there are four high-level themes of the, of the book. One is, and this is a challenge not to Eric personally, but to his world of political theory, that legitimacy is as important of questions of justice, that the legitimacy of our institutions of government are what allow us to pursue and debate um, justice and how we think about justice. Without the legitimacy of government institutions, we will be completely adrift. And as Larry alluded to, um, we are living through that a bit. So we're being reminded that the legitimacy of institutions of government matters. It is secondly, um, again, as Larry alluded to, engaging with the debate about technocracy versus populism. Most of the books written about that are about the hazards of populism and what to do about it. Mine is a book from within technocracy saying, please can we retreat a bit both for our own sakes, it's self-interested in, in terms of my tribe, but also in the interests of our system of government. It is also, thirdly, um, the book argues that what, one could be, what could be called legal liberalism is insufficient. By that I mean that having, relying on judges who are unelected to ensure that unelected regulators and others don't exercise their powers arbitrarily is necessary, but it is not sufficient to underpin the legitimacy of our form of government. Our Republican values matter too, and that would be just as true on the other side of the Atlantic um, as here. So it's an exercise in bringing our political values to rational choice, institutional design, and it doesn't take a monolithic view approach to our political values, but a kind of rather wide-ranging view. I'm going to say two other things quickly. One is... <clears throat> 
This matters, particularly in the United States, less so on the other side of the Atlantic. By an independent agency, I mean an agency that is insulated day to day from both the elected executive branch, the president and the administration, and from Congress. The, the attributes of such independent agencies are that they have control over their instruments, the policymakers have job security, and they have budgetary autonomy. On that definition, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC in this country are independent agencies. There are many, many more in the UK, but the SEC, the CFTC, the Trade Commission, and others are not independent because they have to go to Congress each year for their, for their money. Um, two more slides. This is a sketch of what I recommend, that if you delegate um, powers to people that are insulated day to day from both branches of government, well, then the country, there ought to be bipartisan support for the purpose of the um, delegation. There ought to be a problem um, of keeping the promises of government um, so that the, the objective is credible. That matters hugely in central banking. Um, these unelected people ought not to make big choices about distributional issues, shifting resources from this side of the room to that side of the room. They ought not to make um, choices about high-level values. They, they ought to take their decisions in committees rather than one person taking the, the decisions. They ought to be transparent so there can be rich public debate and effective congressional oversight. There ought to be clarity about what they can do in emergencies. And if they, if they have more than one mission, as the central banks do, then they ought to have different committees um, for the different missions, each one with a majority that just does that. So some consequences as a provocation. There is a great debate in this country about the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. By my lights, it should not be an independent agency because it has vague objectives, and therefore its single policymaker is deciding high policy. I think my forebears in, the, in England fought hard to ensure that our parliament made those um, decisions, and I think you inherited those values um, over here. It's a good thing. Many people, I think, in the, I think Mrs. Clinton at one point called for the S SEC to, to have budgetary autonomy, autonomy. I think it's a good thing that it doesn't, um, given that it's got these vague objectives. Um, and I think the Environmental Protection Agency, I, I suspect there are many people in this room who are very frustrated um, with the EPA's policies now, but by my lights, it's a good thing that it is under political control because I don't think there is remotely a consensus in this country about policy on climate change. One may regret that, but that's a matter for politicians rather than for unelected people. The, 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 the greatest challenge to a US audience that I can offer is that I'm afraid I ended up feeling that what may be incentive compatible in this country, I'll explain what I mean by that in a sentence in a second, maybe not be compatible with our deep political values. I think Congress has very limited incentives to, to um, delegate precisely. I think it has very limited incentives to adopt a principled approach um, to delegation to something that's under political control or not under political control. If I'm right about that, we should be disturbed because that is not what the political values of this country and that underpin the Constitution with a big C require. I'll stop there. Thank you, Paul. That gets us off to a uh, good start. The uh, first discussant is um, Alberto Alessina. Alberto is the Nathaniel Ropes Professor of Political Economy at Harvard, something I was once in the uh, mists of uh, <laughs> the past. Alberto is perhaps the leading scholar of uh, political economy um, around uh, the world and has written extensively on questions relating to uh, the design of public institutions and uh, relationship between the structure of public institutions and uh, economic uh, outcomes. Uh, his work was influential in the shift uh, during the 1980s towards the reification of central bank independence as a profoundly important uh, value uh, for a uh, central bank. 
Alberto. Thank you, Larry. Um, you said that in Michigan they reject expert. Uh, I come from a country they, where they have rejected expert, and uh, let me tell you, it's not a good, a good view uh, in uh, in uh, in a government of non-expert uh, in Italy. But um, so, uh, first of all, I read the book by Paul uh, way before it was published because Paul was kind enough to send me his chapter. But let me, but let me start from a. Uh, for a very basic point. There are two types of democracy. One is of alternating dictators. Namely, you elect uh, somebody, and for the case of the US, you elect a president, and with a voting system that doesn't permit divide the government, and the president appoints the Supreme Court that changes every four years, then it appoints every single agency, it runs the central bank directly, and, and that's it. Every four years, you change dictator. Uh, or you can have a, a system with a lot of checks and balances that could be in a variety of ways, including, to stay on the topic, uh, uh, independent, non-elected agency, where by non-elected I mean appointed by the political system in a, after a number of years, but not coinciding directly with the election of, of the government. Now, there are clearly pros and cons in the two types of democracy. The first one you may have excessive variability of policy, which may be detrimental. detrimental. Uh, you may end up with the wrong dictator or somebody who was elected and looked reasonable and then it turned out to be a really bad dictator. As we know historically, many even terrible dictators have been elected. And, uh, so, and, the, con and the cons of checks and balances and independent uh, agencies that you may get a lot of nothing gets done because there is too much checks and balances, or bureaucrats go off uh, the wrong way, and it becomes a bit of a mess, and you can't give direction to the country, and people may feel that they're not completely represented. Now, uh, within this uh, framework, let me say a couple of things about central bank independence, uh, which is something, as Larry kindly suggested, I worked on with him, even though he may have changed his mind. Uh, so in uh, about 20 years ago, we wrote a paper, uh, Larry and I, that said that it's good to have independent central bank because they, uh, and actually Larry mentioned it was cited this week in The Economist, that um, because the independent central banks tend to have reduced inflation uh, at little or no cost in terms of lost output. And so when the problem is inflation, to have independent central bank is a good idea. Now, Larry now disagrees with that and say that now that inflation is not a problem anymore, we shouldn't have a central, independent central bank. And I profoundly disagree with him on this point uh, for, a, for, I think, five reasons. The first one is that inflation may come back at some point. I think we as economists have a tendency to project the present too far in the future. Before the financial crisis, we were talking about the great moderation. Business cycles are over. We are all happy and done. And now we, now we have the financial crisis. Now there are low interest rates. We are at zero lower bound. Now we think, oh, the zero lower bound will continue for 30 years and we'll never get back to normal interest rates. So I think, we, I think that's not right. I mean, inflation may come back. Uh, now, central banks are not necessarily obsessed about reducing inflation. Currently, both the Fed and the, Euro and the ECB are trying to increase inflation and get back to at least the 2% target. The U.S. has gotten there, in Europe not quite. There are other reasons why you want to keep central bank away from politics, like political business cycles, that before elections, uh, uh, government may want the central bank to do something which is not quite the right thing to do. There are the greatest example in the U.S., like in the 1970s, Nixon. We are reading today about Trump uh, bashing the, the central, the Fed, because they are correctly raising interest rate. In fact, probably most economists would think that they should have raised them earlier and more. And Trump is bashing them. And if, if Trump, if, if the central bank were not independent, you know. Uh, in Europe, uh, the ECB, after a period in which Trichet wasn't exactly probably the best central bank ever, but Mario Draghi 
uh, was supportive and the monetary policy has been quite uh, um, favorable to helping solve the fiscal problem in Europe. So, you know, independent central bank have done reasonably well. And my fifth reason may be the most important. Uh, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Namely, I don't, I haven't seen much evidence that uh, independent central bank have created uh, disasters uh, around the world, but I have seen example of non-independent central bank that created uh, 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 disasters. Now, but I agree with Paul that you know not everything can, not every policy can be run by independent uh, agencies. Uh, so the question is which. And uh, in a couple of papers with with Dr. Bellini. Uh, which are entitled bureaucrats uh, versus politicians that Paul has kind enough cited in his book, we investigate a little bit that problem. And we think of, of uh, politicians as people, as people that want to make their choice in order to maximize their chances of being reelected, not surprisingly. And we, mo we model bureaucrats, say uh, high level bureaucrats, like, like a central banker, as people that want to maximize career concern. Namely, they want to look good, they want to perhaps have a career in the private sector later, but they don't care about being elected and re-elected. And uh, so we reached the, con the conclusion that the tasks that are more likely uh, to be, the tasks that should be uh, delegated more are tasks where are highly technical in nature and uh, and the task in which that have reasonably low distributional consequences, and everything is a distributional consequence, but choosing a tailor rule uh, or you know targeting a little bit more unemployment or a little less inflation is certainly a distributional consequence, but certainly much less than choosing the level of progressivity of the income tax, say so. Uh, that's why tasks like monetary policy are more easily uh, delegated than, uh, than uh, um, fiscal policy. And finally, independent, uh, in fact, let me add a footnote that several years ago, Alan Blinder wrote a paper uh, arguing that the title was, is there more, do we need more delegation? And he was making the point perhaps extreme, that even in things like fiscal policy, why not delegate? Suppose you decide that your goal for fiscal policy is to achieve a certain level of progressivity in the distribution of uh, the tax burden. Why not to delegate to an agency the task of choosing the most efficient, less distortionary way of achieving that distributional goal? That may make be going a little bit too far, but the point is, once an agency has a clear goal, uh, then it's a matter of doing it in the best uh, possible way. And I see, and I see a lot of uh, a lot of benefits uh, uh, in that, especially for uh, for central bank. And finally, even independent central banks, they move within the boundaries of 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 the political arena. If, if uh, central banks did something which is really completely off the, 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 the target uh, of their goals and really go against, directly against the, uh, their statute and uh, uh, that they, they could be, they should be, and there could be option to, uh, to, uh, to uh, intervene. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. Eric Bierbaum is professor of government at Harvard University and chair of committee committee on the degree in social studies. He is a leading uh, philosopher of issues relating to democratic uh, theory, uh, the author of an important book, In Our Name, uh, The Ethics of uh, Democracy. Um, he has uh, written recently on whether democratic leadership is possible. Eric. Well, as a political theorist, I want to express my gratitude uh, that we in, in political and democratic theory have had an embed 
uh, for 30 years uh, in an independent agency. There's nothing quite like this before to have a book uh, from an embed. Uh, and I mean that because he's not a converted philosopher. Uh, he has been one through and through. And uh, the book really shines because of that. Uh, the way he, from the inside, captures the sense on the outside that uh, certain independent agencies seem passive. But I take it, when you were in there, it felt rather active and, and robust. And so what, what follows is a marvelous mix of realism, idealism. Uh, and it really is a magisterial book. And so I want to raise uh, three puzzles that come out of it. And I've been tasked with looking in particular at part two, the sort of normative meat of the book. And interestingly, in a book about independent agency, that middle part two kind of functions quasi-independently. Uh, that is that some of the arguments in part three require it, but many don't. Uh, that if you accept the account of democracy that Paul uh, plays with, it will aid the account, but he thinks there are other prudential reasons to go with it as well. So there is that sort of autonomous structure to it that is worth uh, noticing. And uh, the first uh, puzzle I want to raise is one about derivatives, not market derivatives, but as you call it, the structure of derived legitimacy. The thought is that I may be able to transfer powers, maybe there's certain kinds of moral powers, uh, but I don't get legitimacy for free in the group that I transfer it to. That requires, on Paul's view, a complex mix of a pedigree, you can tell a story, uh, that meets certain democratic credentials. Uh, but that's insufficient. In fact, when Paul was discussing the book, he kept stressing, necessary but sufficient. He has that tendency to layer on demands that, we, that may surprise uh, all of us of coming from a practitioner. Um, and uh, I think he offers, in, in part two, the most sophisticated discussion of principal agency theory in the context of democracy uh, that I've, I've seen. He contrasts it with the military, with the judiciary. Uh, and if you you imagine this, this could go terribly wrong, because if you overplay pedigree, you could get a chain of delegation so complex that it looks something like those, you've probably seen the pictures of those intricate transplant tr chains uh, for organs. Uh, and you know, they go multiple levels. You know, uh, of, of, uh, there's beauty when you see it, but in this context, it could be a farce if you didn't then give a functional account, which is what Paul gives, of what the agency's doing. So it's not enough that you can draw some line from someone who's been elected at some point. It's far more robust. And among the, the five conditions he sets, the first one, that you must specify the goal. And he's, Paul's already raised some worries about underspecified, underdetermined goals. Um, I would sort of add on top of that what you might think of as the three laws of robotics problem, right? which is that uh, you may be able to specify a goal, but is it co-possible when you have joint goals? This is something that, that Paul is very much alive to, given that um, if you think about the Federal Reserve in particular as having something like a triple mandate today, uh, price stability, maximal sustainable uh, employment, and financial stability, and if you think that those three are not always co-possible, or at least they demand some kind of lexical ranking, uh, you might worry the degree to which condition one, now that the Fed bears that much responsibility, is capable of meeting. Just like people have played with these three rules that we're supposed to give robots so they don't become our overlords. And people have found these loopholes in the same kind of way, because those aren't necessarily co-possible goals. So that's the puzzle. And I think I would just add, in a friendly way, that the account of legitimacy that Paul gives us, transfer of mor moral powers, uh, I think is, is a crucial one. I think what I would play with is the frame. I would stress the negative frame. That is, we know an agency, however independent, has authority, and in particular has the legitimacy Paul's looking for, when it makes a mistake, and what we then do in the hands of that mistaken entity. Uh, that, to me, is the real stress test for legitimacy in this context. Of course, it was the Fed that now has annual stress tests for banks. And so you might think, as a test, would be uh, when Greenspan uttered irrational exuberance, he was messaging one of his audiences. Uh, in particular, uh, the banking industry. But then did he miss the other audience when he should have, on many people's view, warned us about housing prices? There you might think there's another worry about co-possibility, because he's testifying in the most runic way possible. It raises some worries, I think, about Paul's account of transparency when if the peak of the, and he acknowledges this, this is, you know, but if, the, if, the, if one of the embodiments of the Fed is, uh, is Greenspan, uh, then you might think that the kind of uh, carefully cultivated uh, imprecision, or maybe it's precision being ambiguous, uh, is not an embodiment of that transparency. And Paul thinks there's ways to correct and, and counter that. But So that, in some ways, raises the first issue. Once you give a functional account and you give a lot of conditions, as Paul does, uh, do you deliver a set of constraints that are co-achievable? It's not always clear that the Fed is going to meet that, as an example. The second example I want to give, uh, the kind of puzzle, is 
it's the place of the Fed in the book as a kind of duck-rabbit issue. It comes out of what Paul acknowledges uh, as I would call blinders dilemma. Either we see the Fed as a truly unique, freakish entity, uh, given the extreme power, and so we're tempted to see it as quite different from normal election commissions, other kinds of independent agencies, or we quickly call for a proliferation of these kinds of uh, commissions. Uh, and I would st stress that both those seem in the book to be kind of horns, right? We don't really want to go either way and, and view the Fed as entirely special, even though uh, the sheer amount of money and the ability uh, to uh, create money on the fly, uh, the, the kind of way it's invented, uh, and the use of qualitative easing, these are all examples that where it makes it look a rather unique creature, peculiar institution within all the agencies that Paul's talking about. But he, he pulls back and he suggests that actually there's a sense in which election commissions as independent agents, even if they don't wield as much power when it comes to sheer force, they're the real guardians. These are protecting democracy in a particular kind of way. And that he would consign even an agency as powerful as the Fed as a more of a trustee organization. He makes that distinction. But I have to say there are moments uh, when it looks like what the Fed does. He evokes Plato's guardians. I would add the nocturnal council and the laws, where, which some of the all-nighters that I think the Fed pulled during the crisis mirror the Nocturnal Council in particular, but that that makes me worry when you say, no, if there's going to be a fourth branch, uh, it's not going to be uh, you know, Fed-like agencies. It will actually be election commissions and other guardians. Uh, but in terms of sheer power, it's, it's a hard uh, pill to swallow always. The final puzzle, because I know we're limited for time, uh, is to ask a question sort of dear to my heart, which is when the Fed speaks in particular, uh, let's think of uh, as a particular case, Janet Yellen, who does she speak for? Um, can she speak for us under any condition? So the most interesting example uh, is when uh, Yellen uh, did something extremely scandalous. Uh, uh, she had uh, gave a speech where she talked about inequality. This made the front page of the Wall Street Journal in the New York Times some years ago. Um, and it, it's by the cautious standards quote, this is the New York Times, the central bankers, it was downright radical um, for her to even refer to the existence of what she said, quote, the extent and continuing increase in inequality in the United States. And um, it's an interesting puzzle for Paul's uh, sort of condition five. On his view, independent agencies should not make big choices in distributional trade-offs, that that's where they start to encroach upon our power uh, and our extended lawmaking power through our legislatures. But you might think that when Yellen did this. She didn't connect the dots in the speech and then ask the question of to what extent is the Fed's relationship to growth producing a certain kind of Im radically imbalanced inequality. But that was there. If you connect the dots in her speech, that was the implication. So the next natural step is to ask, then, could she see herself as Fed as empowered to alter strategies on the grounds of not preventing, but reducing the rate of the massive increase of inequality? I take it that's where Paul would say that would be uh, a, a, an extension of agency that would not be properly derived legitimacy. Uh, but it also suggests to me uh, a puzzle for, as you say often, you, you worry about the only game in town term when we refer to the Fed. But if you have a theory of inequality that turns in part upon the Fed's complicity in uh, balloon inequality, and it's the only levers are held by the Fed, it seems to put uh, 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 in a certain kind of box someone uh, who, uh, like Yellen, who, on your view, the account of what's motivating her is that she is looking for deferred esteem. And I would say, in some ways, is the deferred esteem going to come from people who, um, uh, the historians, who will look back and look at the Fed's role and, and what's happened to uh, the state of our inequality, or is it a shorter term? Uh, 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 so in some ways, ha the, if the Fed itself exists in part because of short-termism, to what extent should the Fed, him or herself, should, should the chairman, him or herself, uh, be uh, open to the broadest, most long-term view, which is the place of the Fed in uh, the scandalous story about inequality in the United States. So three little puzzles. But thank Paul so much for this book. Daphne, Daphne Renan uh, teaches at the Harvard Law School. She served uh, in the transition for, to the Obama Justice uh, Department and then served as an advisor to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States and in uh, the office of the legal counsel at a moment where issues affecting uh, the Justice Department were vexed, but perhaps slightly less vexed uh, than uh, they are uh, today. Um, I'm 
I will on a different occasion to have to ask you why the Justice Department in its wisdom felt that we could have an entire financial crisis of the magnitude we had and not a single person was prosecuted related to that financial crisis uh, in a way that led to their incarceration or serious punishment. But on this occasion, I'm most eager to hear your views on Paul's, uh, on Paul's book. Yeah? Okay. All right. It's a remarkable undertaking to think about systemically how we should govern agency insulation in modern democracies. And uh, in the U.S., just taking financial regulation and thinking about it, the continuities and discontinuities with the administrative state is itself a contribution and an important important contribution at that. So it's a, it's a remarkable book um, that gets at really the core of what we in administrative law theory grapple with about how to have um, a legitimate structure to the insulation to bureaucrats. So uh, I thought I'd offer some perspectives from the American experience and specifically from the uh, public law and public law theory and start with the nature of agency independence and how we should think about a framework for governing insulation from uh, short-term day-to-day politics. So I'll observe just briefly that your definition of agency independence is different from the definition that we have in U.S. constitutional law, which in U.S. constitutional law, an agency is independent if and only if the heads have four-cause removal protection, what we call four-cause removal protection from the president, meaning that the president can't fire the agency heads at will. So this is both necessary and sufficient under U.S. constitutional law to identify an independent agency. You, I think, very valuably resist this understanding of an independent agency. You argue that a truly independent agency, as you showed us, have three characteristics, and they include the control over policy instruments, job security, and budgetary independence. Okay, so I wonder if you could actually go further, though, because the structure of your argument, the structure, the framework that you offer us for how to govern agency insulation is that we can identify a category called independent agency, that we can identify it because of its characteristics, whether it's one or three characteristics, and then we can attach principles of governance to this category. In the United States, which shares a very similar framework for how we think about the governance of agencies, scholars are starting to push back and to say that actually agency independence is not really a binary. That what we see is that there's a number of different design features that promote insulation or independence for agencies. And they range, they include job security, but they also include specified terms, partisan balance requirements, um, independent litigation authority, and a variety of other features. And what we see and what's kind of hinted to in the different agencies that you started with um, in the PowerPoint presentation is that actually the administrative state has a ton of agencies that have some of these features in different combinations, right? And so this continuum might be especially useful if we're thinking about governing insulation from short-term politics and political considerations and facilitating credible commitments. But if that's the case, do we want a framework for governing agency insulation that hinges on identifying this category, this category with these three specific features to the exclusion of other features that we could look to for promoting insulation? So that's one, one set of uh, questions. It relates to the kind of who decides question, right? So who decides whether insulated agencies are legitimately or constitutionally configured? So your principles for delegation embrace certain features, what you call design precepts, things like multiple member structures, staggered terms, a long duration. And so we get the question of what institutions in government should decide whether agencies should be configured in this way. 
And it's an important question in the US right now because we might be on the cusp of a pretty dramatic change. So increasingly what we're seeing is courts, and in particular the US Supreme Court, using constitutional law, using Article II jurisprudence, that's our article that governs presidential power, to say what is a permissible and appropriate design of an independent agency. So then Judge, now Justice Kavanaugh, is very much a leader in this approach to Article II. And when he was on the DC Circuit, he took the position that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, one of the agencies that you focus on, is unconstitutional as a matter of Article II because it lacks this multi-member structure which you see as an important principle for delegation. So it raises the question of do we want courts using constitutional law, using Article II jurisprudence to enforce the principles of delegation? And it might be useful analytically to think of two different types of roles that we could imagine the courts playing here. So courts might enforce the principles for delegation directly using Article II jurisprudence as Judge Kavanaugh, then Judge Kavanaugh would have done in the CFPB case. Or courts might enforce the principles indirectly. So for example, they could raise the cost of having agencies with designs that are not compatible with the principles by giving heightened scrutiny to the decisions of those agencies. So it might be worth giving some thought in future research to what role do we want constitutionalism and legal constitutionalism to play with respect to the principles for delegation. Finally, I'll just move really quickly beyond courts to the actors that are doing the delegating to our legislatures and executive branch. And here, a question that I think picks up on some of the themes, um, starting with Larry from our talk, is what if this disjunction between our incentives and our political values actually goes all the way down? What if we've created a structure of government where the incentive or the it creates a disincentive for governance, right? If that's what our legislature looks like, should that affect how we think about when it's appropriate to delegate to independent agencies, right? In developing a normative theory, a constitutional theory of when it's appropriate to delegate to agencies, do we want to think about these structures, legislatures, the executive, formally as kind of a black box, or do we want to see some of the dysfunctions, whether it's hyperpartisanship or gridlock, that are defining them today. So three questions sparked by your really tremendous book. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. Our uh, final uh, commentator is Kathleen McNamara, professor of government and foreign service uh, at uh, Georgetown. Her work focuses on markets, uh, culture, and politics in the European Union and the United States. She's the author of The Politics of Everyday Europe, Constructing Authority in the European, uh, in the European Union. And her work has appeared in many, many uh, different places. OK, thank you very much. Kathleen. Well, thank you for having me, Paul. Thank you for inviting me here. And uh, I'll join everyone in sort of praising this book. And, and note that you talk about um, being taken seriously, but I will turn the tables and say it's rarely that practitioners take academics seriously. And that's really what you have done in this book. Um, you and I have been talking for many years about a lot of these issues. Um, um, I'm going to be really terrible and, and tell a story, which is I first heard about you when um, a colleague at MIT, um, David Singer, sent me a photograph of a PowerPoint where you had my Rational Fictions article front and center and said that you thought it was very smart, something along those lines. I thought, well, he, this is obviously a very small, smart central banker that he would think that. Um, because some of my work has, in fact, you know, challenged the notion of central bank independence, and I will continue doing that today, despite your in incredibly uh, effective and persuasive book. Uh, I'll also note that I think you know, the fact that we have colleagues on this panel from very different backgrounds and different sort of theoretical and academic interests also speaks really to, to Paul's book in the sense that it is an incredibly synthetic and incredibly sort of deeply read book that, that really sort of breaks the bounds of, of traditional scholarship and, and, uh, and thus I, uh, I admire that very much. Um, so what do I want to talk about today? Well, um, 
One important thing about this book that, that Daphna has, has already commented on is that Paul takes central bank independence as sort of what, a case of a larger <coughs> phenomena, right? The question of whether and how politicians should delegate power to unelected technocrats. Um, and to me, he rightly focuses not just on the sort of material outcomes that might flow from such delegation, what in EU studies we call output legitimacy, right? That's our way of claiming that the EU is, in fact, completely legitimate, right? Um, he instead focuses at a, at a much deeper level on the question of legitimacy um, in the sense of society accepting the authority of the institution and its right to govern even when they may disagree with its policies. Right? And he mentions, importantly, that this really isn't a sort of active level of support. Right? People aren't sort of constantly thinking and talking about these institutions, but it's a set of background assumptions that sort of keeps, keeps everything running. Um, and the, the book you know, presents this very uh, important sort of menu of principles that might help uh, such institutions gain legitimacy. And I'll sort of boil it down to three things, that there really does need to be this need for some sort of credible commitment for this independence, right? So generally speaking, you wouldn't just do this all the time. You really need to have some compelling need. Secondly, the benefits do need to be um, material, but distributional decisions should remain with elected officials, right? That in fact, um, that needs to be part of the political process. And therefore, he argues, delegation should be values compatible, right? It shouldn't just incentivize the kinds of behavior we want to see. It should really dovetail with these, again, these deeper societal values that, that are so important. And under these conditions, delegation uh, 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 can be viewed as, as legitimate. So when I think about this argument, um, there is a, a question, a puzzle, a sort of uh, you know, contestation that, that comes to mind. Um, based partly on sort of my, my thinking about this, uh, these issues over the years. When I think about central bank independence, I very much think about it as a product of a certain point in time, right? That we see central bank independence really take off uh, starting the early 1990s. There's this kind of explosive growth in, in delegation to uh, independent central banks. And in my view, it's really driven by a set of beliefs, right, about time and consistency problems and inflation, which, you know, obviously we have some... Uh, folks who, who are very much part of, of making those uh, arguments. But I think that it's important to note that central bank independence is not simply a sort of um, uh, uh, an answer to a functional problem that will hold always and everywhere, but rather there was a set of economic ideas that, that grew and logics that, that were um, put forward that matched a set of ideologies, that there were motivated actors who probably thought this type of logic was, was very uh, useful because the emphasis on price stability and low inflation privileged investors and privileged uh, the price stability tended to actually emphasize right, in low inflation over things like growth right, and workers. Right? And so even though there was this very, very robust consensus, it was quite a narrow consensus held only by a group of people. And so for me, central bank independence cannot be viewed as something that's merely a technical exercise or something that does not have distributional consequences. But rather, the distributional consequences can be somewhat masked by the narrowness of this sort of consensus, right? So where are we today? Well, I think in this post-crisis era, which again, Paul you know, grapples with very head on in the book, and I think you know, it's a tremendous motivation for the book, central bank independence has morphed right, into a panoply of unconventional monetary policies, far beyond the emphasis on price stability and playing around with the interest rates to get to that, which again, our speakers have, have well outlined. Um, at the same time, I would argue, there's been a breakdown in this sort of underlying sense of social purpose, which Paul correctly points to as being so important. This sense of shared values around the benefits of delegation to technocrats who have a very distinct view of how to run the economy. Um, I would argue we're at, we're, at a, we're at a time of intense political disruption and uh, social disruption. Um, for which this type of consensus is, is quite uh, fragile and quite, it's, it's, it's not clear that this is a robust enough consensus to uh, make central bank independence um, appropriate. Um, 
I think that the rising of inequality in the United States, the changing nature of work, stagnant wages, and so on, have created a set of political pre pressures that have really blown open the sort of background assumptions and values that initially did uh, legitimize uh, central bank independence. So um, Sir Paul Tucker is very right to point to the need for this broader political debate and set of political values beyond central banks um, and thinking through what are the social purposes that can be harnessed through these institutional designs to respond and address uh, all of these things. Um, but I would argue that an, more technocracy, and I think he would absolutely agree with me here, more technocracy is not the solution to this sort of tenuous legitimacy problem. You know, essentially, sadly, there's no substitute for politics. Right? And that is, I think, where we are as a, as a nation uh, at this moment in time. And again, I think uh, Paul very much would agree, would agree with me on this. But I would emphasize that we need to think about um, sort of political parties and the political process as addressing the genuine dissatisfactions uh, that are out there and the social instability and the political instability, and that mainstream political parties need to grapple with all this. And that really is the bigger and broader project uh, beyond um, thinking about um, delegation to central banks. And therefore, Paul's book is clearly an impressive and persuasive argument for the conditions under which independent central banks can be legitimate. But I fear that at the moment, central banks are embedded within these larger set of dynamics for which there are no easy answers. Thank you. <laughs> Such a I'm going to turn this back to uh, <laughs> Paul and just a minute, but I'm going to make just a couple of remarks, uh, if I could. And I am a meat-eating, number-crunching economist with roughly no credentials as a political philosopher. So these may be, or a student of the administrative state, so these may be entirely uh, out of bounds. But I would say uh, three things. Uh, one, uh, something Daphne said seemed to me like it had to be right, mm -hmm. that we should think about these things as being along continuums rather than as independent or not independent. To take a kind of obvious point, if you have a, if you are appointed for a one week term sub, with no prospect of removal during your one week term, but you are appointed for only a one week term, I would imagine that's roughly equivalent to working for the person who appoints you. But in a de jure sense, you would meet the concept that you describe of independence. And so on each of these things, it seems to me, if your budget is set for 15 years, not for one year at a time. So it seems to me yes. that it's best to think about these things along a spectrum of uh, independence. The second, and I think this got addressed in a variety of ways that I didn't fully understand quite what was being said, so I'll just state my kind of uh, question. Uh, you know, going back long before you get to the intricate questions here, there's the question of like, is the only reason we have a legislature rather than have a referendum on everything because it's infeasible to have a referendum on everything? Or do we have some idea that having a legislature tempers everybody's passions and keep thing, keeps things more rational than if you had a referendum on everything at every uh, moment. Well, it seems to me that some large part of why actual people prefer actual independence is because they think Congress can't be trusted to do the right thing because Congress is over sensitive to the will of uh, the people. I know that when I was uh, involved in these things. I wanted the Fed to be crucially involved in bailouts because people, and so did the Senate, because the Senate knew that bailouts were unpopular and it knew that bailouts were the right thing. And so kind of saying the Fed did it was kind of a better way uh, to do things. And so the question of what, what should just be insulated because you'll have better decisions to do unpopular things or 
to do things that are insulated from the fact that money is a major force in politics or a variety of other things. I think like the dysfunctionality of democracy is a kind of central question around what should be uh, what what should be independent and when shouldn't be. And I guess the third thing, which I guess I'd like to hear Paul speak about, is how special how special is central banking every time i hear somebody give like the case for central banking it always seems kind of persuasive but not more persuasive than the case for political independence of prosecution not more independent than you know wars pretty important too and you know diplomacy is really kind of complicated, and there are all kinds of short-term incentives. And so, really, it'd be better to kind of have foreign policy not be subject to so much damn electoral uh, pressure. Trade agreements, the structure of the tax system—you can make a case for the independence of just about everything. And I guess I'd be interested at the end of the day, Paul, in your view as to whether I'm wrong. Central banking is more special in ways I'm just not smart enough, I'm not able to perceive, or whether your view is more stuff should be independent, like uh, central banking, or whether you sort of have the Alberto defense, which is kind of central bank independence seems to work pretty well, and maybe there's an equally good case for other things being independent, be, but it'd be hard to imagine our moving to that, and so let's um, let's just kind of keep it the way it is, even though we can't give a first principles justification. I guess I'd be interested in knowing where you came out at the end of the day on that with respect to central banking. Why don't we give? Let me make a suggestion. Why don't yeah. we give you a, just a short time to respond to some of what we've heard? Yeah. Then turn this to the floor yeah. to put questions to the panel and then give you a longer interval at the end as the last word. Yeah. And then cut me off if I go on for too long. I will. That will be just fine. Um, so, so, so this was this was really marvelous if you've spent time working on this book, as I obviously have. I mean, in a sense, the exercise, as, as, as you know, the book is an exercise in... Alessina and Tabellini is taken to political theory and public law and political science. Uh, Alberto's work with Guido Tabellini is by far the best work in political economy economics. Um, okay, the check is in the mail. The But when you read it with a broader view, you think, well, so what would people with a different perspective think of this? And if I look back on uh, my period in office, I think something I regret, both individually and on behalf of the various bodies I was on, is that we were always huddled in the corner with economists and to some extent with international relations people, but didn't allow in other disciplines, not knowing that they were talking about us all the time, um, which is how I discovered Kate's um, stuff. T two substantive comments, one on something um, that Eric said and then bringing together... Um, Daphne, Kate, and, and, um, and Larry. If you take Janet Yellen's speech on inequality, so I think this was a great missed opportunity. The speech that Janet gave, in fact, to the Federal Reserve Board at Boston, was just about inequality, and she's a very distinguished um, labor economist, amongst many other things. And it, so the, 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 I think the reason it alienated people, including some very senior ex-Fed people, well, this looked like using the um, power as a platform to talk about things that she happened to know about. And something I talk about at the end of the book is that hard norms can't be enough. You also need an ethic of self-restraint, um, given it does give you the most incredible um, platform, um, particularly if you're the chair of the Federal Reserve. But I think she could have given a, a different speech, which was, we, we are doing things that... Um, are having distributional effects, in particular quantitative um, easing. We're not doing them in order to have distributional effects. We're doing that against a background where there's been an increase in inequality in the country, and we either do or don't think that the instruments we have and the mandate that we have 
could be used to address that. And to the extent that she concluded, as I think she should have done, um, in terms of positive economics, that we don't have instruments that can address that. You know, that's for other policymakers, not for us. And so I think she could have used it with, I mean, with, with a bit of deafness to take the issue to politics and legitimizing her voice in that space. And I don't think it did that. I, th I think the bigger issue being raised here is about um, the continuum of independence, which I completely agree with. Um, and in a sense, what I think, and I think what Judge Kavanaugh hasn't done yet, is articulate carefully principles that you would apply for different degrees of independence, given the nature of the um, delegation. And I think of this as, um, this, is, this is all in the realm of constitutionalism. How far do we want to embed certain structures to insulate them from day-to-day -day politics? So the, the judiciary, we want to really, really entrench them. You know, Article 3. Um, central banking, not quite so much. Primary legislation. Something else, a bit, a bit less. You've got to go and get your money each year. Something else, a bit less. The president can get up and be fed up with you and, and sack you. And I think, this, I think this goes to your challenge. So let me give you an example where I think there is too little independence in this country. I said earlier that I think it's good that the SEC have to go back and get their money each year, given the vagueness of their objectives, and that Congress can give them a formal steer. I, by my lights, it, um, there is a kind of welfare um, depletion from the, from the lack in this country of a body that is more completely insulated from day-to-day -day politics in regulating the stability of the markets. I would not place much money on the, on the SEC as a guardian of stability in markets, because Congress will be egging them on as the years pass and, and, and kind of reducing their ability to, to, um, mm. to preserve the stability of markets. That's, whereas I think er Eric mentioned this, whereas I think an electoral commission is, is quite different from central banking. Mm. I mean, if you have a body whose job is to ensure the integrity of democratic politics itself, gerrymandering, who can vote, campaign finance. You, you don't want, you want that to be more, ins if you want it at all, you might want it to be a lot more insulated from, um, from politics than central banks. You really want them to be guardians of the, the democratic constitution, just as the justices are meant to be guardians of the rule of law. Are you sure? Can I, okay, are you sure that you think? I'm not sure. I think different, but you spoke with a lot of confidence, and I wouldn't have been so sure that if the SEC were free from Congress, maybe the SEC would not do all this stupid stuff that some congressman pushes it to because some campaign contributor contributor gets to Congress and all that. And, Maybe it would be better. Yeah. Or maybe the SEC would come absent accountability to Congress to mostly be accountable to the people it saw every day who were the firms that it regulated. Yeah. Yeah. And it would actually be worse. And I'm surprised if somebody's way confident about which way it goes. I suspect one can find examples in both directions. So the gap between us here is you are thinking of the actual SEC in the world, and I'm thinking of some um, reformed SEC where I've split them into two in some way. Do I think if the, the SEC, with its tight connections with the securities bar, could be relied upon if freed from Congress to maintain market stability? No. Do I think that this country could design an institution um, with a clear mandate to maintain market stability, um, yes, I think it could. It would not have all the responsibilities that the SEC... But has. I guess the larger question, without debating the SEC, I think the larger question would be, do, don't we worry that institutions that are, not, that are insulated from politics and have a regulatory function will come over time to be identified 
with the interests of those uh, that they regulate as a kind of continuing and chronic problem, whatever bit of cleverness you may bring to uh, the uh, bring to the bring to the original design. Okay, so I th the answer to that, of course, is is yes. And so, although it spends less time on it, I am, the book is as concerned with independence from the regulated as it is um, concerned with independence from politicians. And I think that the a necessary condition for bringing that off when it's warranted is again a clear objective that can be monitored so that I'm, I'm this independent regulator and I'm meant to be delivering X and you're out there observing it and you're saying that's not X, I can see it's not X, that's bending to the will of the, of the people he's meant to regulate. Now what that means is that if you can't frame X um, in a way that's clear and can be monitored, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't have insulation from politics at all. I mean, it, wherever I have to choose between a welfare hit and a legitimacy hit, I'm taking a welfare hit. Floor is open. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid your view of government seems to be a little different than what I perceive. Uh, I, I think you, you seem to be taking this at sort of direction or, you know, vector of independence and non-independence and whatever, and making a lot of it, and I'm not saying one shouldn't because I haven't read your book, but there's a whole new other set of dimensions in my view. And I, I know a lot about, in particular, say FERC and EPA as regulatory agencies. Okay. Now, you just sort of seem to complain about them in a sense that they had very vague descriptions for what they're supposed to do, and maybe in their initial legislation setting them up, that's true. But basically, they wouldn't, like EPA wouldn't have anything to do if Congress didn't pass legislation to regulate clean air, clean water, you know, you name it, right? So there's some fairly detailed legislation that gets them going in the first place, so they have something to do, okay? So whether they're independent or not, you know, in, in your sense, Congress gives them the direction. Now, to actually implement the legislation, right, is a huge task, right? Congress themselves would have no idea how they should implement the legislation they write, right? Which is partly why it's, it's fairly vague often. Because, you know, it takes real experts, technocrats, in that field often to even begin to figure out what to do. And even within those regulatory agencies, they often have experts, like I happen to be one, that goes there and testifies about, in fact, how these, uh, you know, congressional uh, mandates should, should be implemented. And then, of course, there are various checks and balances between the agencies and the courts. So given the complexity of the modern world, I see complexity as a dimension that deals with how agencies have to actually implement legislation that you, you seem to be neglecting. So and I think it's very important in terms of the so independence. That, so, that, so that if the complexity that you, can, you describe um, can only be responded to by the legislators through vague mandates with the regulator f filling in the details, then I think that warrants, in the case of the EPA, it not being um, an insulated agency, that it, it warrants it being under the day-to-day -day control of the president in the sense that the president can sack the head. And when a new president is appointed, um, the the, the direction of policy will, will, will change. I don't think we're disagreeing about that. I think what you, can't, what you can't get through that is a commitment to a policy course over a number of years or, or decades that will set up, um, give um, people in the industry and consumers very strong expectations of what policy will be because policy will tend to move around as the preferences of politicians um, change. And then the question I frame is, well, in those circumstances, if commitment, if the, if the, if the lack of credible commitment is, is, means that society is incurring welfare benefits, could we frame the mandate more precisely so as to warrant some greater insulation? Um, my answer in the environmental area is absolutely not in this um, 
in this country. So I, I don't think we're, we're disagreeing. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with complexity in, um, in government institutions. What you have to do towards the top of the institution is, is ask yourself, what is it that they're really asking us to do? And actually, with, when, the, when the mandates are vague, the, the truth is they're asking us to decide, people like me, to decide what they really want to do. And I simply don't believe that that belongs in, a, in an agency insulated from politics and tried very hard to design a particular institution so that, it, so that we weren't made the country's governors. So the world you've described, the politicians are the governors, not the, not the EPA. And that's because Congress can fix the budget each year and the president can say, that's not my policy. Um, um, get out. Couldn't do that to me. Or the prime minister couldn't do that to me. The prime minister tried to sack me. Hard luck. Yes, sir. Um, I, I find you know, the general argument quite persuasive in the challenges. But the, uh, the issue of material consequences came up. And I think of two major cases which give me pause about the argument. Uh, kind of counterfactual. What if we didn't have independent central banks in Europe in, an interest in, in Europe in 2012? and the central bank in the US right now. Uh, would the central banks in both cases uh, yes. been able to act to avoid really very serious material consequences if, they, if, if, they, if, if, the, if those independent central banks didn't exist? If Draghi had not yes. been able to take yes. the initiative, I mean, the spiraling of the, con of the crisis that was developing then that he was able to head off, uh, or rather his actions was able to head off disaster. Yeah. And I think of the current case, the Powell Fed, uh, if we don't, didn't have the Powell Fed to offset the utterly irresponsible fiscal policy of the administration, what kind of... Uh, really rather dire consequences could, could follow. Well, and I'll let what, would, what would that mean for how we decide the role of the internet? So the, the I'll, I'll wants to say something about central banking as well. But the, the thing I want to emphasize here, which brings me back to part of Larry's question, is I, I, I would suggest to you that the European Central Bank, we're in the Center for European Studies, is profoundly different. Um, from the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England um, or the Swiss National Bank or, in a slightly different way, the, the Bank of Japan, because it is in what, by normal standards, would be regarded as an inst incomplete constitutional setup with no counterpart fiscal authority. The, the, latent, the latent or quasi-fiscal capabilities of, of the central bank end up being deployed. There'll be people in this room that know that the dreadful Nazi period, um, German political theorist Carl Schmitt um, said that the person who is truly sovereign is the person um, who decides things in emergencies. Um, I, I, I regret greatly the fashion for Carl Schmitt in this country, which is truly bizarre and not happening in Britain. Um, but the ECB was the existential guarantor of the European project at a certain um, moment. I, I, I think. I think that's completely different from anything that Jay is going to face with President Trump or any other president. It's completely different from anything that Mervyn and I faced or Eddie George faced in the, um, in the UK. And I think it puts Mario and his successors um, under a great burden to, to try and um, bring the ECB back to birth, back to the, back to the role proper for somebody who is unelected, um, rather, rather than being this, this guardian um, of, of the polity he is meant to serve rather than just simply preserve. Well, I wanted to say three things. The first a footnote of what you said that, you know, Mario Draghi, in a sense, is being, is being halfway between what the German would like him to do and what the Italian populist would like him to do. And so it's, it's, it's a good example of, of sticking to the middle. But I have, I'd like to make two comments, one on Kathleen and one on Larry. The one on Katrin, your argument was that 
essentially central bank independence in the 90s was a right-wing maneuver of people that are obsessed about inflation and they, they care more about inflation than unemployment and income inequality and all of that. And when, and when the mood change, then we need to change uh, the rule of central bank to have more inflation, less unemployment, less inequality. I think you are giving a little bit too much power to what monetary policy can do. Uh, I don't think central banks can do very much about, uh, about long-term growth. They can stabilize the cycle. Uh, if you have, you know, 10% inflation forever, you're not going to increase growth. And by the way, there is a lot of evidence that high level of inflation are re redistributed against the poor. And uh, example of Latin America, high inflation, an example of really expropriating uh, the poor because the rich can defend themselves against inflation. So they use the monetary policy by, by, by printing money, you can solve long run, uh, prob long run growth, reduce unemployment forever and so on. It just, it's just not right. So, uh, and and uh, central bank independence, independent central bank from the mid 80s to the financial crisis, they may have overlooked financial stability and that was a problem that we economists didn't understand and so on, but they generated what the period was called great moderation, low inflation, high growth, low unemployment. Income inequality in the US and in other world has nothing to do with monetary policy. It has to do with millions of other things that I don't think that monetary policy can, uh, can solve. Regarding Larry, your question was, what's so special about central bank? If, if, if central bank are independent, why don't we have many other things independent? You mentioned diplomacy. Of course, it's a good question. I think my answer is that, uh, first of all, we need to think about what, the, what should be independent, what should be not, and that's yeah. why Paul wrote the book. Yeah. But regarding your example, what I thought that in diplomacy is about, you know, international issues. Every day there is something happening. There's a terrorist attack there. Saudi Arabia killed a, a, a thing, a journalist. Every day there is something that you need to think about that may affect your policy stance. You know, we're now used to the financial crisis, but monetary policy 90% of the time is bloody boring, really. Nothing really happened. You have to raise interest rate a little, lower it down a little bit. So tell appoint uh, a, a good guy or a good woman like Janet Yellen. I agree with you, you shouldn't be talking about an, uh, inequality because there's nothing she can do about inequality. And let them carry around. When there is a huge crisis, which of course is rare, then we will need to do something. When there was a the huge crisis, Paulson and uh, uh, Bernanke showed up together uh, in front of Congress. And if I came from Mass, I would say, wow, what is, the central bank is not independent. They're going together to talk to Congress. There was a crisis and you know the system adjusted to get monetary policy involved with, with fiscal issues and stability issues. So, but most of the time, monetary policy is bloody boring. You follow a, a Taylor rule, or raise interest rate and cut them a little bit and, and that's it. Can I just add that Paul's book uh, contains at least one thought experiment. He says, suppose the Federal Reserve were, uh, act, the Federal Reserve Act was, was repealed what would happen? What would it look like? And I mean, it directly answers your question of how it would be chaotic. But I feel like yesterday with Jerome Powell being described as Trump's biggest threat, uh, you have a different way it's being, if not repealed, but constitutionally questioned. In the, so one day the press got a break from being the biggest threat. It was the Fed. And it will go back to the press today. But it really is a different way you can, you can nibble at. Uh, I, I at want to say something about these attacks by Trump on, on the Fed, because they're being debated a lot and everyone is responding with horror. Um, there's a book just been published by Paul Volcker with um, a co-author, and something that was not published, it was a, there was a bit of thing in the New York Times a couple of days ago. In the mid-1980s, um, he had to go and see Reagan and Jim Baker, and Reagan didn't, and not in the Oval Office, and, Jim, and Reagan didn't speak, and Jim Baker said, um, we order you not to raise interest rates. And so something that you could, I don't know what, Paul Paul's a, I shouldn't think that made any difference whatsoever to Paul. But the key thing about Trump, if I were in office, I, I would shrug this off and I would be happy that it was happening in public rather than that kind of, I mean, 
being an independent central banker, and I mean, there are moments, I mean, this is for grown-ups only, I mean, and it is contact, it is contact sport, where the sport, you know, and you have to, you have to have a very strong sense that your parliament or your congress have made you independent, and that's that. And if they want to change the law, they can change the law, and people can shout at you and spread rumors about you and all sorts of other things, but nevertheless, your duty is to your elected legislature. And actually, the president advertising this, in some respects, makes it slightly easy, easier for Chairman Powell to navigate than it would be if it were invisible or if it were done through innuendo and, and, and rumor. But you know the American system better than so I, I do. I, I just say a couple, two or three things about this central bank independence conversation. First, I think Trump's thing is just sort of insane from his point of view. Surely, it is much more difficult for the Fed to adjust its path towards easing than it why, was. Why, oh, why are you saying from his, his point of view? Because it's much more difficult yes. for the Fed to adjust its policy in an easy direction than it was a week ago, yeah. and because it will look like just a a craven political act rather than a considered financial judgment. So, I mean, I always used to tell the people in the Clinton administration who wanted to sound off on this subject that the problem with this is the Fed won't listen, so short-term interest rates won't be any different, and the market will, so long-term interest rates will be higher. So whatever your objective, this is a bad thing thing to do. Uh, second Second observation, just... I don't know anything about the political philosophy. I think I know a little bit about the economics. Most of what people say about, cent- and anybody who speaks confidently about the impact of central banks on distribution is, I think, probably making a mistake. The problem is there are two different types of effects. One, which many people talk about in recent years, is that if the Fed lowers interest rates, asset prices tend to go up, and rich people own assets, so it tends to be good for rich people. And that argument is made. On the other hand, if your asset price, if your stock pays you a dividend of a dollar a year, and you're going to live forever and you're going to consume a dollar a year, it may not matter to you much whether your stock is worth $10 because the interest rate's 10% or worth $20 because the interest rate is 5%. On the other hand, there's another way of looking at it, which is, Rich people tend to lend money. Poor people tend to borrow money. And on that theory, low interest rates are a pro-poor uh, thing, or at least low real interest rates are. So yeah. I just think yeah. this, these discussions that have the character, the Fed has a predictable impact, or the monetary policies we, pers- we pursued created a lot of inequality. I just think people should be much more cautious about making uh, those kinds of uh, those kinds of statements than they typically are. Anybody who cares, uh, if you Google Larry Summers' Central Bank Independence, you can find a little essay I wrote for the wrote for a Bank of England conference that gives my views. In, I only find our papers too. Well, you know, find our papers <laughs> as well. I, I, that, get, uh, that, give, that, that gives my views. I think it's I think it's more difficult than you do, Alberto, to single out uh, what the central bank does. You know, a question I was wondering about as we were talking was take an unimportant thing, the design of the currency. Well, you kind of want that to be done for the long run. You kind of want that to be done artistically. You certainly don't want an administration to be deifying its political presences with the design of the currency. Maybe we should make that independent. Um, and yet that sits squarely within the Treasury Department yeah. in, the, uh, in, uh, in the United States. You know, you said, you talk about foreign policy. There is a thing that Congress does all the time. There are about 100 of these. There are about 100, no, no, not 100. There are probably 10 things that have the following character. Some fraction of Congress is incredibly concerned about money laundering, or they're incredibly concerned about sponsoring terrorism, or they're incredibly concerned about um, mistreatment of uh, women. And they want to single out and go after countries that do that. <laughs> 
And so what they basically declare is that some part of the State Department that's not responsive to the Secretary of State has to go designate yeah. which are the bad states on this issue. And the reason they do that is because if you put the Secretary of State in charge, the Secretary of State will kind of be an adult and it'll and will reason, you know, we got a lot of issues, we've got a lot of fish to fry with country X. And so we shouldn't go picking a fight with them about the fact that they've got seven people imprisoned, given all of our equities. But we want to make it be all about this equity. So we're going to take that away from overall discretion. I don't know whether you think that's good or whether you think that's bad as a device, but it does point up that there are a lot of things we do that have the character of making something independent and somewhat insulated uh, from judgment. And I guess the last thing I'd say is it's not like this is only an issue for government. You know, it's a big issue at this university. You know, what does the dean get to decide? What does the chairman of the literature department uh, get to uh, get to decide? Do we have the idea that which corporations tend to, but most other organizations don't, that there's a kind of hierarchy. And if you're the CEO of GE, then more or less anything at GE that you want to decide, it's your privilege to decide. But that's not the principle on which the, most churches are built or most universities are built or most uh, governments are built. So it's actually a very, very broad, in some ways it's an even broader issue yeah. than the design of government institutions. Yeah. yeah. Let's take two more comments and then we're going to, and which we'll take as a group, and then we're going to give Paul a chance to respond at length. Uh, we give anybody else on the panel who wants to say anything a chance, and then we're going to give Paul a chance. Yes. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Thank you for the discussion. Um, I wanted to, and it's good to see you again after a few years. Um, I wanted to ask about a word that kind of came up briefly but wasn't dwelled upon, which is capture. And kind of independence might mean true independence, but very often the question is dependent on who? Dependent on the president and thus presidential politics and all the incentives that he or she faces, dependent on the Congress and thus dependent on congressional politics and everything that they face, dependent on a cabinet secretary, dependent on an industry. And I wonder whether, to some extent, is independence a sort of red herring? And is the question just which kind of dependence? And that, it would seem, A, is a spectrum, per the earlier discussion, and B, would vary, that you might prefer one type of agency to be dependent on one principle for one set of reasons and a very different calculus for another one. I, I, I think that's fair. I think it goes to Daphne's point about a, about a continuum. Um, in a sense, thinking about dependencies is just the obverse of thinking about um, independence. But it, it prompts me to say something about capture. Towards the end of the book, I, I say something about appointments. I came to think that for very powerful independent agencies, like the Federal Reserve or like the ECB, um, it should be the last professional thing that you do. Um, that you should be getting on a bit when you're appointed, not because you're any wiser or better. Actually, you might be more tired and everything else, um, but, but so that there is no prospect that the reason that, what, that as you're doing it, you're really bidding for, for something else, something that will make you very rich in a firm or some. Um, it's hard to make these things immune to appointment to an international um, organization, but... But one of the things I like about, I think this is more or less, I think there are big problems with the design of the Supreme Court here, but one of the things I like about the Supreme Court here, and is certainly true of the Supreme Court justices in the UK, is that, who have, don't have tenure but have long-term limits, is that when they retire, they, they disappear from public life. They don't, and actually there is a rule uh, in the judicial code in the UK that they can't go back and practice at the bar again or anything. Um, like that, and that's a completely that would be a completely unreasonable 
um, constraint to put on somebody who was 40 or 45 or even 50. And, and so I think we have to, if we're going to have these fantastically powerful institutions and, and, and you know, what, what feels the power almost, um, then, um, then we need to think more about what's their afterlife, how, how, how can we look after that, which also has implications for pay. You know, you're not going to get people to do these jobs un unless they have um, some kind of standard of living which, which fits with their peer group. People that do these things don't want to be rich, but they don't want to be poor either. The last three Democratic presidents have begun their terms by decreeing a set of principles of the kind you describe for the, for the people they appoint. And they have then found themselves highly frustrated <laughs> yes, they because they didn't actually want to appoint everybody over 70 yes. to be in charge <laughs> of tax policy. And they have then backed off their rules yeah. or at the end of their terms seen a set of injustice yes. and have backed off. So I think it's – you might be right, but it is – a I think I think presidents appoint lots of people who are cog, but some of them are quite distinguished individuals, but who are cogs in the broader machine. But they're not true power holders in the way that the chair of the Federal Reserve um, is. So uh, maybe the president, these presidents, were just too blanket in their in their approach. No, but for example, to take the issue that was that I was happened to have some involvement in, and that was most vexed. The person who's in charge of who the most important person who spends 100% of their life thinking about taxes and thinking about the structure of the tax code and the way the tax code, the rules are going to be articulated, the legislation is going to be implemented, what's going to be done about the major cases. Yeah. That's a highly responsible position. Yes. And it's kind of natural to say that if you going to do that, maybe you shouldn't go back to representing Goldman Sachs afterwards. Yeah. And that's what presidents say, or at least you got to wait five years before you do go work for yeah. Goldman Sachs. Well, you can say that, but you then do find your choices as to who's going to do those jobs yeah. Yeah. extremely, um, extremely limited. And by the way, um, how do we feel about heads of state? There's, if we're going to impose these principles on the head of the Federal Reserve, is it going to, is it going to be our view that the ex-Prime Minister of England is not permitted to give, us, to give a speech at the Morgan Stanley Investment Forum? Um, or that the Prime Minister of Germany can't work for Gazprom? It's, it's very, very interesting you say that because... One of, my, one of my principles of self-restraint is that if you've held the kind of office that I did, you should be res, res, publicly restrained on those issues even when you have left office. Uh, your restraint has not... I'm reminded, thinking of you, <laughs> of um, our colleague, um, John Kenneth Galbraith, was a spectacularly successful author. And at some point, he decided that Harvard had made it possible for him to do this, and he was doing just fine, and so he would accept a salary that was frozen in nominal terms. Yeah. And he remarks in his autobiography that he had adopted this principle in the hope of emulation, <laughs> which he had not noticed uh, took place. And I guess that's my reaction to your restraint. Yes. That's a Final words. <laughs> Final words, members of the panel. I guess I'll, I'll, I, I, I knew my, my comments would, of course, have, have some reactions. But I, I would just make the um, point that, you know, even if central banking is boring and, you know, it's unclear in terms of the economic um, scholarship on these issues that it may not be able to have a direct impact on, financial, on uh, income inequality and so on, I think, you know, we have to step back and sort of think about legitimacy and governance, as Paul does in this book, very, um, very persuasively and, and very appropriately, as being about larger issues and that central banks truly are embedded within these larger sets of conversations and societal um, 
uh, understandings and political activities. And so even though we might want to take refuge in our understandings of the sort of rational uh, uh, under, you know, thinking through what people's preferences should be, I think we simply have to think through the politics as well. That's all. Maybe just say um, one, I think, challenge to the thesis that's come out in a lot of different ways in the discussion is the, the role of path dependence and how we create a theory and in practice a pathway to legitimacy given what are a lot of layered, unrelated decisions that comprise the, the structure of the administrative state here in the US and, and more generally insulated agencies globally. Yeah, I would just say, as I said, the, you know, the book preempts so much and, and, and kind of is such a discursive in its structure that the more you push it, the more it pushes back. So even on the question of the question about the baselines, so are we comparing uh, the virtues of independent agency as against a horribly ungovernable situation. Uh, sometimes Paul's doing that, but other times he's not. He's not letting himself to that easier argument. He keeps raising the bar and says, no, how would it do as we made things rosier institutionally? And I think he thinks that that's the real sense in which I'm going to you know, have the highest possible bar of difficulty and still make a, a defense here. And under these circumstances, it often involves prettying up our legislative uh, state of affairs right now. And I think that was a surprising thing. I thought you would go for, <laughs> initially, uh, look at Congress, now, look at uh, ungovernability uh, here and, and abroad. And, and you didn't do that. It's worth noting. Well, I'll pass. I've read this book a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> Paul? Um, well, first of all, thank you to all of you. And thank you to some people in the, in the audience who've been incredibly supportive. Look, I, sh I, should, I should mention Steve Cacchetti. Um, in the, in the acknowledgments, I go through a kind of cascade where I, I think an anti-penultimate is Larry, penultimate is Steve, and the very last is my Mine. wife in terms of the support they provided. So thank you to all of you who provided support for writing the book. I've got, I've got two things to say. One is the, the, the crucial ingredient in the book in terms of what I think matters in democracies is public debate. And... And what I most want to do is enrich a discussion in academia, partly across different disciplines about these things. You imagine we've been dis um, discussing the Supreme Court. Dick Fallon has written a book about the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. It, it would have been much more coherently framed in advance because people have been discussing that kind of thing for two and a half centuries. I mean, Montesquieu, Madison, and Locke really were. I mean, they are giants. and um, They didn't discuss any of this stuff at all because it didn't exist. Um, then. So if I stimulate, in a sense, I don't care whether the book um, survives or not. I, what I care about is that it prompts, it prompts um, debate. But the final thing I would say, and I think Daphne turned on this, is really the book is a plea for legislators, people we elect to do their job. And we as citizens need to reevaluate our expectations of them and be more determined um, and hold them to account. Our tribe of people that make policy, we are adrift if our legislatures are, are passive. Um, and that would be a terrible thing in our societies. Thank you all very much for giving up the time to be here. Really Thank grateful. You. Thank you.